really interesting question. And I think that there's kind of four components to this. So the, the, first, the first part of this is really the ability to talk to a large subset of your customers. So programs are really good at um, you know, collecting data and, uh, and collecting customer identity and giving you, giving you permission to talk to them. So when there's major changes or disruption in your business, being able to communicate to your customers is really important. So that's, where, that's the first reason why programs are important. Um, the second part of it is really the, the ability to access lower cost incentives. So when we think about engaging and re retaining customers and actually trying to get them to come back after being in lockdown, after being, you know, not being able to come into stores, for example, um, you know, discounting is really expensive. So when you have a program, you have status rewards, you have incentives. Uh, often they are better ways of, of um, getting good out, uh, good customer outcomes. The third aspect to it really is the data that you collect through your program. Uh, and what that helps you do is understand your customers better and understand your business better. And the reason that's important is Think about it this way, if, if, you, if you have to close all of your stores, then technically everyone has lapsed. So how do, you, how do you decide where to spend your money? How do you decide how to think about your churn models, your ROI calculations, and also your marketing strategy? So the data asset is the third competitive advantage and, and um, uh, value that you get out of the program during these times. And the fourth, doesn't apply to everybody, but when you have a currency that you're selling to third parties, often a program can be a source of liquidity. And so we've seen big travel companies, hotels, airlines, et cetera, actually um, selling large numbers of points for their partners at a time when they really need cash. So that sort of source of cash through the program is super important, particularly where you've got a, an airline or a hotel um, that can't operate or can't fly. So when we think about competitive advantage, I think it's important that we think about this in, in the context of uh, a brand's competitors. So what is it that you've got that, that gives you an advantage over your competitors? Just having a program often isn't enough. In many consumer sectors, you know, loyalty programs are pervasive across uh, multiple brands. So it's about how do you make your program better than your competitors? And so I think that's really important from a competitive advantage standpoint. Uh, and if you've got a good program and it's working well, some of the advantages that you get out of them include uh, a defense against switching. And when we think about switching, switching is really that, that thing that happens when we lose a customer or we lose part of the value of the customer. And what we know through all of our analysis is that switching is most likely to happen during significant life events. Things like you get married, you get divorced, you get a new job, you have a baby, you go to university, you leave university. You enter a pandemic, uh, you have to work from home, you have to work with your wife all the time, you have to homeschool your kids. All of these major life events actually force us often um, to switch brands and that's because our needs change. So having a good loyalty program actually acts as a defence against switching because we can start to predict who's likely to switch and we can do something about it. The second, the second aspect to this is um, really how we think about allocating our marketing investment. And so when we think about the challenges that brands have gone through during the pandemic, generally speaking, people will have lower revenues and less profit. And so it becomes tough to think about where we spend our money on customers when we can reopen and we can start trading again. And so programs become really important ways of thinking about how we allocate that marketing investment. And so we can't just spend money and give big rewards to everybody. So it allows us to make the right decisions around where we can get the best ROI uh, on our marketing spend. I think the third aspect to it is about customer retention. And so this, this ties back to this whole question around switching. Uh, programs do their best job at retaining customers. Yes, they can help you acquire if they're good. Uh, and they can, in some cases, help you deliver bigger baskets, but ultimately they're about retaining customers. And so again, I think during, during a pandemic, a pandemic uh, you, you could argue that, that um, most customers have lapsed because they've had to, other than maybe maybe grocery stores and pharmacy, et cetera. So um, competitive advantage comes through making your program do a better job of retaining your customers and getting them back than your competitor. I think the pandemic and COVID-19 has been a fabulous case study of what, what, you, what you should do and what you shouldn't do when it comes to operating a program. Uh, I've never felt more love from brands that I have really no affinity with, uh, particularly if I look at my in email inbox. 
uh, all of a sudden I've got companies emailing me tell, telling me how much they care about me when I haven't shot with them for years. Um, and then, then you've got other you've got other brands actually doing a better job of, of actually keeping their customers informed, getting the messaging right, actually just um, being much more service orientated than uh, sort of fake or, or sales orientated. Uh, but I think what it, what it comes down to is is being practical and relevant. Uh, Nike's done a great job uh, in the US. Uh, what what they did was they they uh, had this whole play inside campaign. Uh, they made the Nike Training Club app free. Uh, and that made it a whole lot easier for custom uh, for their for their customers and members to be able to access great content around exercising and staying fit and healthy. Uh, Medibank in Australia, uh, great Australian health insurance brand, has a Live Better program. Uh, they reward customers for, for being healthy, for staying healthy, for eating healthy, uh, and they've seen a 20% increase in exercise of their members during the lockdown, and a 50% increase in healthy eating all on the back of their um, their loyalty program. Uh, we've also seen companies like eBay who have a program, eBay Plus, uh, and that's that's a um, really interesting model. Uh, it offers deals, discounts, and free shopping. And when, when it comes to, um, you know, not being able to visit the, visit the shop, that program has really high utility. Um, some other interesting things that we've seen, uh, we've seen some of the big hotel chains and airlines selling enormous amounts of, um, of, of points to their partners. Uh, and, and in a couple of cases, American Express has, has purchased over a billion dollars in, uh, in, in loyalty points uh, ahead, ahead of requiring those, which, which helps them um, you know, uh, effectively with a, a lower cost incentive for their customers. And it helps the partner in terms of cash flows. The airlines have done some interesting things. Uh, and so we've seen here that um, you know, Virgin and Qantas have uh, shifted their status uh, mechanisms so that they're not penalising customers who can't fly. Uh, Qantas has shifted a lot of their focus from flying um, benefits into shopping benefits. And so they've actually been quite active in, in encouraging engagement through the program with things that you can do as opposed to things that you can't do. Uh, and we've seen Cathay do, do something interesting and they're really leveraging this behavioural economic phenomenon called the endowed progress effect. They're actually incentivizing customers on a regular basis um, to keep them engaged in the program and to keep their status ticking over uh, whilst customers can't fly. So, so trying to keep the customer engaged and feeling like they've got a vested interest in the program. So when we think about when we think about budget, it, it matters it matters as much now as it does in in, in normal. Uh, business times. The, the, the reality is, is that as a, as a program owner or a program op operator, you, you should always be able to articulate the value that your program's delivering. Uh, and good, good programs deliver positive ROI. And so wh whether that's um, how, how we think about using the program to respond to a downturn, or in a general sense, how we think about it as an asset in the business, we should always think about getting the, uh, as, as um, optimised returns out of our program as possible. And that means spending our money, sp spending the company's money wisely and really rewarding and incentivising the right behaviours from a customer perspective. But I think, I think there is an opportunity right now to rethink our programs. There's been a lot of uh, focus on how we react to the pandemic. And what that means is that we've had to change programs, we've had to cut costs in some instances, we've had to change messaging, we've had to turn off churn models and uh, AR models that, um, you know, have, have been disrupted by this major change in consumer behaviour. But as we come out of it, I think brands really need to think about what they stand for. And so when we think about um, loyalty investments and programs, I think what's really important is, is making sure you're clear on what you stand for uh, and really what you want the program to do. And the, 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 the challenge comes when, when, when brands don't have that clarity. And they get they get they get caught in this vortex of complacency and indecision, trying to be everything to everybody, and they end up being nothing to nobody. And so we need to think about you know how does the how does the program fit within our broader customer strategy, and really what do we want it to stand for? Is it is it about the best rewards? Is it about reinforcing other parts of the brand CVP? Is it about being the most innovative? Is it about um, is it about you know um, doing as best as you can to try and really lock that, that customer in? Things like subscription-based models and other mechanisms to do that. 
So there is, there is an opportunity uh, while, while customers have been focused on other things and not actually you know, um, purchasing like they normally would, to really think about what do we want our, co- our program to stand for? How do we think about those loyalty investments to make that program land as best as possible for the priority customer segments that you're going after, for the behaviours that you're going after? I think most importantly, for the, for the way in which you want it to support the overall um, you know, brand messaging and uh, positioning that the, the company is looking to do. Uh, and if we look at the marketplace, the, ev- the evidence suggests that um, there's, been, there's actually been less activity during the pandemic around, around programs, albeit it's only been a few months. So it's only a fairly short kind of sample window. Um, in, in Australia, we've seen some, 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 act, some interesting activity. We've seen Qantas being quite active with enhancements to their program, uh, and we've seen we've seen some other um, uh, you know, relaunches and, and improvements. That said, I think philosophically, uh, we believe now is the time to be working on your improvements, working on those enhancements, making those really tough decisions around how you're going to improve uh, and and enhance and reinvigorate your program. But it feels like the time the time to be actually making noise in the market is is is, is about to hit. It's, it's that time when customers and people in general go from focusing on um, you know, things other than shopping and traveling and and uh, all, all of those great consumer uh, vices, things like what to do with the kids and you know are we going to be safe and healthy. Um, I think I think now that we're coming out of this, I think now's the time to really be thinking about how you land those improvements with the customer. And so hopefully you've been really busy whilst everyone's been working from home, doing all of that in great internal work that's required to reshape and relaunch your proposition. Uh, because uh, yeah, as we know, those things take time. Uh, but if, you, if, you, if you've done that well, it really feels like the recovery phase is gonna be the best time to really um, capture the customer's attention with improvements uh, and new aspects to your program. And, we, and we, we expect to see some of that. I think that um, p- part of it will be taking the opportunity to simplify the proposition. Uh, I think a lot of programs are going to have to recalibrate their, their um, earned thresholds and their earned structures. So if you think about the gold gradient effect, customers actually work harder the closer they get to a reward. Well, if they've not been able to spend for a few months, if they've actually been impacted in terms of their spending firepower, then a lot of programs are going to have to are going to have to become uh, you know um, richer effectively to, to make the rewards um, more more attainable. So I, I think we're going to go into a really exciting period of relaunch and reinvigoration, and I uh, fully expect that a lot of loyalty practitioners have been quite busy uh, during this quiet period working through all those complications.